Adventure Hour. I'm your host. I'm Rob Lupo from Lupo Outdoors. So today is going to be very interesting. Um, today I have a special guest, a gentleman by the name of Chad, who does some great bench press shooting, which is something that I'm very, very interested in. Um, and he's also very much into long range shooting. So he's going to talk to us a bit about what he really enjoys doing and how he got into it. So without further ado, hey, Chad. Hey, Rob. How's it going? Why can't I hear you? Oh, I'm getting a bit of an echo. Okay. Can you hear me now? I don't hear you. <laughs> Let's see here. For some bizarre reason. Can you hear all right? We have technical difficulties. This is working about 20 seconds ago. <laughs> all right, he's going to fix this thing here. Can you hear me okay? Save this. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Wow, this is just wonderful. Can you hear me? I can hear you now. Can you hear me? No, I can't okay. hear you. Wow, this is just wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I are you all right you're good all right say something how about now rob am i coming through now you are okay so some kind of weird mute situation there that's all right <laughs> And there was an echo before that sounds like it is gone as well. Yep. I think we're good to roll. <laughs> All right. Sorry about the technical difficulties, everybody. But, hey, I got Chad on here. Yay, technology. All right, Chad, talk to us a little bit. So um, tell us about yourself. Yep. So my name is Chad Wanzing. Uh, I'm an IT uh, sales guy, technical dude, um, just kind of as my day job. Um, but uh, in for my hobbies, right? One of my biggest things I love doing is long range shooting. Right. And Rob, I apologize. It sounds like it's kind of playing uh, on about a 10 or 15 second delay in my headset. That's all right. Don't look at the picture. Just talk. <laughs> <laughs> Not a problem. We got it going, right? It'll be all right. Yep. But yeah. So um, one of the things that I do, right? I've, building my own guns, uh, building my own ammo, um, and really uh, kind of getting out to to hone a craft, right? That was kind of my big thing. Okay. So tell me a little bit about what got you into uh, Bantrush shooting? What was the inspiration to, to take that move? Yeah, so interestingly, the, the kind of move into bench rest shooting um, was uh, a buddy of mine, uh, Joe Henderson and I here in uh, Northeast Georgia. We really wanted to get into kind of learning a bit more and, and um, actively working on reading the wind, uh, working on ballistics, right? Honing our loads. And um, Joe at the time, he was a member out at Elbert County Gun Club, uh, kind of north of uh athens georgia sort of out in bfe if you will but uh, a great little spot and every week they have interest competitions and so we said you know what we're never going to win uh, these guys are shooting crazy rigs we're out here with production class guns but you know let's go have a good time and man i'll tell you that's exactly what we did and so we kind of really got into uh, building our loads, customizing them to our particular firearms, um, working on how do we make this as accurate as we can, um, and 
than being able to kind of leverage the expertise of some of these guys that have been doing this 20, 40, 50 years as, you know, hey, how do we take the thing that we're doing and make it you know, a little bit better every time? And uh, that experience has been just absolutely phenomenal. Now, realistically, my um, my trajectory, my anticipated trajectory, actually for me and Joe both, were to start off kind of getting out there, um, doing some shooting around a great group of folks, and then eventually moving into kind of the precision uh, rifle series matches, right? Uh, but uh, so it really was meant to be more of a, a stepping stone that has since become just something that's been a, a great part of, of an experience for me, right? So That's awesome. So, I mean, I, I get that, you know, when you get the bug that bites you and, and your, your first thought is, is like, Oh crap! This is gonna be expensive. Uh, you know, I mean, if you look behind me, you know, you talk about reloading. Here, here's my three through eight Lapua uh, uh, bullets, and these are all thirty calibers. I have my sub X um, for my three hundred blackout. My thirty, you know, three oh eights. Um, they're all basically, you know, high quality bullets. And then all my gear here. Um, quick note. For those who, are, who watch me on a regular basis, uh, next week we'll be in our new studio. So different background, yeah, same show, different background. So I've been working on the studio for the last uh, couple of weeks here. Should look much better than all this behind me. So, Chad, um, what were your first steps in the in getting into bench rest shooting yeah so realistically like i said my my ultimate objective was really to kind of set myself up for participating in the precision rifle series type matches right um so where a lot of times the, the true bench rest crowd i guess maybe the best way to say it you know they'd probably start with a a true action like a true remington 700 action um, maybe even a custom action and kind of build from there with particular bench rest stocks that have you know, three inch wide four ends, lots of weight. Most of those guns are, you know, anywhere from 17 to 50 pounds. Um, for me, uh, I actually started with just a Ruger precision rifle uh, and six millimeter Creedmoor. Um, oh, and nice. yeah, it's, I mean, look, a great little gun. And I'll tell you, I will never say a bad thing. That, that little Ruger precision rifle was way more accurate than I was. All right, let's just start there. Um, so you got, the a, you got an RPR, right? Yep. Ruger Precision Rifle and six yep. Creedmoor. That's right. Yep. Nice. And so you know, I started off just trying to build some good loads. Um, for me, I and I started with um, finding the OAL that I wanted, right? The overall length of the cartridge to see, okay, hey, where is this going to start shooting better? Um, and with that, you kind of pick just sort of a middle of the road uh, charge to see seating depth would actually tend to shoot most effectively there. Um, and then once I figure out what seating depth, right, what length of cartridge, then I started working into what charge weight to really refine a lot of that. Right. Um, so, you know, when it comes to the gear, you can get started very easily. Um, what I'll say is the biggest thing start with what you have right go go find a gun a production gun maybe it's an old 270 that you got from your grandpa that's okay right get out there because like golf bench rest is very much a race for yourself right like sure you're playing with three other guys right a foursome in golf but at the end of the day you might score yourself against them but really it's a competition against yourself to get better every time and so, you know, this idea of building a little bit better load and refining kind of how that goes over time is, is the biggest thing. Uh, so I started off with that Ruger Precision Rifle, building out the loads, um, taking that to a local 100-yard range, seeing how it did, had a couple of um, uh, possible kind of competitors, right? But as uh, if anybody shot behind, beyond a couple hundred yards, you know that, Something that looks really good at 100 yards 
when you get out to three, four hundred yards, could start falling up. And so I'd go out um, to the Albert County Gun Club, their four hundred yard range, and say, "Okay, does this load hold up?" And what we found was, you know, I had a couple of loads that would shoot somewhere in the, you know, two to three inches on a five to ten group. Right? You always want to average that out and see how your group shapes up. Um, and what you're really looking for, hey, you know, left to right. How does my, my water line go, right? So generally you'll find it shouldn't be very tall. But it might be kind of wide just with wind variance and whatnot, right? Um, but uh, those groups are going to show you the consistency in your powder burn and the muzzle velocity of the projectile. Now, um, one of the things that I haven't had yet uh, and I think probably would have helped me out a lot is a chronograph. And, you know, they're not paying me to say this, but the new Garmin Zeros, that are out, I mean, those things will really, right, whether it's that, a lab we are, um, even magneto speeds, right, all of those are really good tools to help you find good, consistent loads, right, good, consistent muzzle velocity, because at the end of the day, that consistency in the muzzle velocity is going to help you put every bullet in the same hole. Yeah, it it's funny because uh, for people who watched the show in the past, that's one of my biggest things I talk about in competition shooting. Uh, as a shotgun shooter, I made sure, because I hand loaded all my shotguns, and, you know, my shotgun uh, ammo at a consistent uh, 1200 feet per second. And that consistency is key. And um, in the past, I told people that uh, when you change your uh projectile speed you're gonna hit far less often right so um it's i find it amusing sometimes when i watch uh people out there with shotguns specifically shotguns because it's a moving target but it it holds true uh to um precision rifle shooting and pistol shooting consistency is absolutely key so if you're sighted in with a bullet that's traveling let's say 3400 feet per second all right and and you've you've dialed in at 100 yards and then you go to different ammo with a different speed cons you know consistent speed your bullet's not going to hit where it hit before maybe at 100 yards but when you start looking at like a thousand yards the consistency is everything so that's that's one of my biggest arguments. Um, so, how long have you been uh, in the in the bench bench rest shooting right now? Um, yep, for a while now. Uh, yes, yeah, so we've probably been doing this now. Was this twenty four? Actually, it's probably now been about five years or so. We've been going out and shooting. And look, we've got five kids, <laughs> right? So, like a lot of folks. Uh, finding time can always be the interesting part, right? So we try and get out at least anywhere, slow years, two matches, maybe four or five matches a, a year, um, but it's a community, right? You get out there and every time you go, you're going to learn something. Uh, and there's there's the matches themselves and then there's the prep, right? And so um, the... Again, the, the kind of getting in and saying, okay, well, I tried this out. I tested this out. How did that do? Okay, great. Now let's try and replicate that again, go out to a match and see how it performs in the real world scenario. In I fact, um, I noticed one of your previous videos on the Anilis, right? That's truthfully been one of the biggest things I've seen is the consistent um, uh, annealing of brass has been a huge part of driving consistent neck tension, consistent bullet release, right? That you really need to kind of get those really consistent muzzle velocities. Yep. Um, and look, regardless of how you do it, some folks will live and die by the annealing made perfect machine. Others, hey, the annealies is the thing. I'm kind of cheap. I do the, uh, the salt bath uh, annealing, right? So, about 900 degrees salt bath in a in a little lee lead pot, um, and I've actually found that to to be really really good for what I do um, mm -hmm. on a dad of five kind of budget. 
Well, I get that. I got, I have three kids and yeah. I only have three kids because after my third kid, I went to the doctor and said, can you make this not happen anymore? <laughs> um, and that's a whole different story. I'll tell you because yeah, that's, that's a trek. Um, but you're, you're spot on the, the and if you watched uh, my video um, uh, last week, the podcast where I was actually at a Neely's and um, you know, he gave me a machine, which is going to be in that whole series. Once again, uh, if you didn't watch it, we're starting up a whole series on annealing. So we're going to be doing precise hand loads and we're going to use different annealers and judge those annealers. And then at the end, do a full bake off uh, on the annealing. And as he explained in the video last week, um, if you have a softer part of your uh, at at the tip of your brass, it's going to release different. So one of the purposes of annealing is not only to prolong the life of the neck, um, but also to have a consistent release of the bullet when you fire. Um, annealing makes a big big difference, and we're going to show that in this series. Uh, we have now five different annealers that we're going to be checking. And I think we have another one coming really, really soon. Um, so we're going to do them all. And um, as I explained last uh, last week, we're going to start with a control group. So I'm going to load five rounds and then, you know, in brand new brass, fire them, clean, load, fire no annealing to see how many shots I can get out for that brass before we see failure. And the failure can be neck crumble, uh, small cracks, etc. cetera. Um, and at that point, it's not safe to load. So that's where I feel the, the consistency with. And then each annealer we test will use the same process, but use that annealer and, and see how it prolongs the life of the brass. Now, some annealers are going to work better than others. And then at the end, we're going to talk about like the best of the best, the best budget, you know, the best mid range and the best high end, and then the best overall. So it's, this is going to be a, a long trek. Um, and one of the first annealers that we're going to work with is one that was sent to me um, a, a little bit back. And what they are is they're kind of looking like chucks. And, you know, they're, you know, they're milled out of aluminum and they go on the end of your drill and then you drop your cartridge in and they're designed for specific cartridges to re reveal the neck. And then you set up uh, your torch and you go in and, and you and you spin it and there are instructions is the moment you start to see a slight glow, you drop it, throw another one in and that's how you do it yep. now. That's a manual process, but each of those chucks are 20 some odd dollars, uh, anywhere from like 24 to $27 for that chuck. And I'll tell you, I feel that even cheap annealing is better than no annealing. So yeah. I'm really anxious to see when we test this out. Now, originally, we're going to do this in 300 blackout. Um, but talking to uh, two people that I trust immensely, we're now going to put it into um, uh, uh, two, two, three shells. And the reason why is the 300 blackout, even though it shoots a 30 caliber, there's really no neck to fail. So you're going to get more yep. shots out of that. Um, but the failures normally in the neck mm -hmm. with two, two, three. Um, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to do the whole thing in, in two, two, three ammo. And, um, we're going to start this weekend, uh, with the, uh, with the load and everything, um, and start building out our test case. Uh, but when well, you start looking at things like, um, really high end annealers, you know, like, you know, the inductive annealing, mm -hmm. I mean, those are scientifically designed to put the perfect anneal on your brass. Now, if you're shooting things like, you know, six millimeter, 6.5 Creedmoor and so forth, um, the rounds, the brass isn't 
as expensive. So it, you know, um, lower end annealers and mid range annealers like annealies are fine. I, I think those are fine. You're going to get prolong, uh, pro, prolonged use out of it. But when you start looking at like the 338 Lapua and the 50 uh, uh, BMGs, were, were that brass <laughs> is expensive. Like the really high end brass for the 338 Lapua is five bucks each. Yep. I want as many shots of that as I can, you know. Well, and the other thing too, especially when it comes to, you know, a lot of the folks that are doing um the the bench like the high end competitive like national level bench rest shooters, they are eliminating every possible uh, variable, right? And a lot of yep. that is differences in neck wall thickness of the brass on one side versus the other. So you'll see folks doing what's called uh, skim turning on the next Right. So literally blades where they trim the neck of the brass to an exact to ensure absolute consistency all the way around. Right. And, you know, for that, you know, they may spend 15, 20 hours or more skim turning the necks. Um, and for brass that you just spent, you know, hours and hours working on this. Right. The loss of one piece of brass. I mean, it just hurts. <laughs> Right. Yep. And so, hey, what can I do to make sure I get every possible load out of that brass so that I don't have to do this, you know, multiple times? Um, and you know, for those sort of scenarios, um, what you're really looking for is, hey, uh, how do I how do I wear out the primer pocket before any other part of the brass? Right. Because yeah. I think if you're going to see loose primers, like that's really generally in my experience, one of the first indicators of, hey, this brass really needs to be done. Right. Um, in my experience with my salt bath annealing, and I haven't done the annealing made perfect. And I would argue the way that they do it is probably a superior methodology. Sorry to the annealies folks. Right. Um, and I think that annealies is really a very close set another automated solution they, they've got a great way of annealing hundreds or thousands of rounds at a time um my salt bath annealing is it as consistent no it's not is it consistent enough right and i think so much of shooting kind of comes down to that trade-off of can i shoot the difference in my rounds and i think that's where a lot of people tend to tend to miss um the the bigger picture right do i need to weigh yeah. every bullet do I need to weigh them and put them in piles by weight and then measure them from the base to the ogive to say, oh, well, this one's a thousandth of an inch longer. And does that affect the way that this round gets loaded or the empty space inside the cartridge? Like all of these variables that you can control for and at a nationally competitive level, maybe you are. Key case in point, Eric Cortina, uh, a nationally recognized, phenomenal bench rest shooter, has a number of national titles under his belt, right? There are few better than him. Has a product called his barrel tuner, right? Uh, it's a, a weight that can adjust on the end of the barrel to adjust the harmonics of the barrel. And as it oscillates, as the bullet travels down um, the lands and grooves and exits the muzzle to try and time those oscillations so that that bullet comes out of the muzzle at the same uh harmonic and in, in every case right yep small adjustments for barometric pressure and everything else right now there's a lot of debate and what they will say is look if i adjust like this i can take a round group and make it flat i could take my round my flat group and bring it to vertical just by adjusting this tuner it's doing something but at the same time, then the, it comes back to, can you shoot the difference, right, of a, of a well-tuned load versus maybe a less tuned load, but with the tuner? Maybe, right? Yeah. <laughs> In some cases, what makes you feel better about your load? Do everything you feel like you need to do to feel confident in what you're bringing to the table. And that's one of the great things about, um, you know, the, the art, I'll say. Of bench rest shooting right you're you're literally trying to minimize the impact of the shooter in this gun game right so think of it as uh hey we're going to build up an f1 ferrari 
right, the gun. I'm going to put it on this bench. I'm going to build a load customized specifically for that one gun. And then I'm going to try and influence it as little as possible, right? I'm going to have a, a three, four ounce trigger so that breathing on it sets off the trigger. I'm going to yeah. maybe not even put my shoulder against the gun because that might influence the way that the gun fires, right? I'm going to try and make tiny, smaller than normal adjustments to the, to the, um, to the scope, right? Scopes that are actually eighth MOA instead of your standard quarter MOA. So they can get just that other half as much distance to be putting that bullet in the exact same hole as every other bullet that they range. Right. Makes perfect and sense. While, you know, I'm just shooting out at Albert County gun club. Uh, I'm still seeing thousand yard matches where the difference between first place and third place on a thousand yard match is a three inch group versus a three and a half inch group at a thousand yards. I mean, these guys are absolutely incredible. Oh yeah. And it's, it's funny. Um, it, some of these guns are just insanity when it comes to cost. Um, my match grade, uh, rifle that I have, um, is it's a custom built. The barrel is like that thick. My the bloody barrels weigh more than the rest of the rifle put together. Uh, and it came with two barrels, both threaded. One of them has um a timing um uh, a timing break, uh, well not a break, but a, a timer on the end, right? Yep. Muzzle timer, and then the other one um I I'm I've set up for my suppressor. Um it's in 6.5 Creedmoor. It it it's a right-handed bolt and a left-handed eject. So yep. I can stay on target and pull back the bolt without having to reach over and yep. grab my shell and set it down. And then I have uh a um a mock genesis, you know, a mock the uh, scope company. I have their Genesis and my optic is six by 60. And I mean, it's, it, this is designed specifically for a long range. The groups are about this much um, at 400 yards. It's a great gun, yep. but I bought it used off of a, a buddy of mine. I did some training, uh, trading with him. That scope is a $6,000 scope. And the rifle itself was about a $10,000 rifle. And I traded him uh, a, a bunch of things for that. And it's it's beautiful. The whole ch uh, chassis is in candy apple red, like a Corvette, because <laughs> he was a Corvette fan. Yep. Uh, so it's the same uh, Corvette colors, but it's a complete custom rifle. Now, that that it's it's a spot on dead on accurate rifle with like top of the line scope. Um, I have a Barrett in three three eight Lapua that should show up on Monday that I that I uh, I purchased, and it's been Cerakoted uh, burnt bronze, which is my favorite. I'm a sucker for burnt bronze, and I just got the scope gonna put on that, and um. It's a uh, Vortex um, Gen 3, yep. and it's 6 by uh, 36 with the 52 uh, lens. And we're going to use that for um, another episode that we're doing here later on this year, uh, which is our quest to a mile. So it, it's like when you're talking about doing like either bench rest or any other type of shooting aside from like a hunting rifle. And I've seen hunting rifles get up there in prices. Uh, when you're talking about competition shooting, uh, every penny you spend should be planned for. And speaking about penny spent, can you give us examples of like the cheapest you can get in the bench rest and talk about some of the products and then can you also talk a little bit about the buy once, cry once? Like if ideally this is what you should buy, but understand sure. it's 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 like, you know, it's gonna cost you your first male born child, right? Well, and I mean that can go a number of different ways, right? And really it's up to the person. Um, for myself, like I 
I kind of, you know, danced with the one I brought with my Ruger precision rifle. And I started off with a Harris bipod. Um, you know, I upgraded to an Atlas Cal eventually, knowing that I kind of wanted to get into the precision rifle series stuff later on. Um, but actually, this is probably a good spot to talk about the different areas within any of the gun games that we play, right? So, you know, whether you're IPFP, right, on the pistol side, you've got different classifications, same way with Ventress. So uh, I actually shoot what we consider production class, which is I've got my Ruger Precision Rifle, I've got a factory barrel, um, I've got just kind of a standard um, optic on it, right? They If it goes above 20x, you have to turn down to 20x optics. Um, but I'm shooting with a bipod and a rear bag. Now, me personally, I'm a guy that I enjoy driving the gun, right? Um, I'm not a free recoil dude, at, and you know, no offense to those, all right? But uh, I like feeling like I'm the guy making the shot. What? So starting with that, you know, Ruger Precision Rifle, general cost, I don't actually, I haven't looked at them lately, right? But generally somewhere $1,000-ish. Right, you can find them for eight hundred. I think they usually go for about twelve hundred, somewhere in there for the rifle. I got so I have an RPR too, and that's mm -hmm. what I started with. Um, and people don't understand that those are really freaking accurate rifles. They're, They're amazing, phenomenal gun, amazing. Yeah, and um, I got mine in three uh, three oh eight. Yep, not because I wanted it in three oh eight, but that's the the what was available. And I got it for eight hundred dollars out the door, about eight hundred dollars out the door, only to find out the guy that was selling it at the um, at the uh, gun shop never fired it. So it was basically brand spanking new for eight hundred bucks. Yeah. But um, the they they run anywhere from uh, from like I seen them about twelve hundred to about two grand, somewhere in that range. Um, what? What I like about the eight uh, three oh eight version is that um, I found somebody online who had a six point five Creedmoor uh, RPR barrel, mm -hmm. and they sold it to me for two hundred bucks. Yep. So I can just when I when that barrel is done, I'll switch over to a six point five Creedmoor, and I just got to put the barrel on, and I'm I'm good to go. Yep. But yeah, it's so a great that's... great rifle. It's a good yeah. starter rifle. Yeah, and that was really one of the big things for me there was uh, the ability for user changeable barrels, right? Um, that actually inspired me to get a Savage as a project gun that has since moved its happy way down the road. Um, but uh, being able to change my own barrels now on my 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 new baby, right? Uh, an impact barrel or an impact action with a Scudaville barrel that you can pre-order these barrels, right? So I, so I can actually get replacement barrels from an online manufacturer in the case of the ruger precision i just need the headspace gauge in there right bring it home screw it down um but with an ar-10 uh wrench right the the lock collar yeah, i can change with this the car wrench yeah yep um i'm kind of on the idea of kind of for the for the thrifty right um something like a ruger precision rifle a howa all of these are, are phenomenal things um Optic wise, my general guideline, expect to spend as much on the optic as you do on the rifle, right? I mean, that's, that's usually a good rule of thumb. Um, so out of the gate, my Ruger Precision Rifle, I picked it up in Athlon Ares uh, BTR. Um, and then like not six months later, they came out with the ETR and I decided I liked the floating dot better. So it actually still wears the BTR, uh, but I recently picked up the ETR for my other gun. Um, again, I paid somewhere around eight hundred to a thousand dollars used right on both of those scopes. Um, but uh, somewhere in the meantime, I picked up uh, to your point, right, a more a more bench resty uh, scope in a in a um, uh, the Vortex Golden Eagle, right? So a fifteen to sixty x uh, or a Vortex Golden Eagle, which phenomenal scope. I mean, it is literally a, a telescope <laughs> on top of a gun. Um, but uh, anyway. So one of uh, real quick, one of our listeners just piped up here says, uh, do you have to torque the barrel? I've never seen uh, changed out, uh, changed one out. 
Yes, you yes. have to torque the barrel. Yeah. Uh, so usually you want to find like a they actually have a special vice, like a barrel vice, um, and an action wrench. That's usually your best there. Um, some folks will kind of put the action vice, hold the action, and then like a strap wrench uh, to get that off. But in all cases, you really want to be using some sort of a torque measuring device, not really the barrel height. Now, that said, I've seen a number of the interest guys talk about, hey, get it hand tight and give it a good twist. It'll be fine. Right? Different strokes for different folks, I guess. Uh, personally, I like to put a little elbow grease on it and make sure it's on there good and tight. Um, but at the same time, this all comes down to those go no go gauges that you're using to check your headspace for the cartridge, right? And so, I guess quick note: headspace being the distance from where the bolt uh, matches up, right, in the action, to the, the cutout in the barrel for the cartridge. And all of these lengths, again, are, are very tightly controlled. Please, you know, before you go changing barrels, uh, make sure you read up on it a little bit. There are recommended torque steps. Uh, these are one of those things that could go really, really wrong. If you're not careful with what you're doing there. Uh, Ricardo says, what's the settings for an AR-15? I, I think Oof. that's kind of dependent on the manufacturer, isn't it? it? In some cases, there are specs. I don't want to I don't want to say off the top just because if I get it wrong, I'd feel terrible if somebody had an accident. Um, so I will say um, lots of threads on this in places like, you know, snipers hide, long range hunting. Um, yeah. right, lots of outdoor for talk about changing barrels. All those fails, uh, contact the manufacturer directly. Yep, you know, exactly. who made who made your uh, uh, your upper, yeah, not the lower, but who made the upper. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. so and I bring that up because I've seen someone make that mistake. Well, you know, I they didn't have an answer for me. I was like, who'd you contact? It goes, well, I call you know, contacted XYZ. I said, but well, but. The upper part of the AR-15 was made by, you know, XYZ, A, and it goes, yeah, I said, so the guy who made the bottom, you know, the lower isn't going to know. <laughs> it's all about, you know, where it's going to be attaching to it. I go, oh, yeah, that's right. Um, so, yeah, no, it's, it's you for the AR. So, like, I'm building a 300 blackout uh, mm -hmm. upper right now, and uh, I got my torque specs specifically for that. So. So it's worth noting, right? As you mentioned, either the upper receiver in the case of an AR or the barrel manufacturer, um, either one of those uh, will generally specify a torque setting. Um, I thought it wasn't going to do it, but I'll go out on a limb here. In in my memory, which is not to be relied on, and you should always go look it up to verify, in my head, it seems to be somewhere around two to foot pounds of torque. Wait, say that one totally more time. Totally wrong. 60 to 80 foot pounds of torque. Right? 60 to 80. And that yeah. could be totally wrong. Please go verify online. But in my head, for some reason, that's kind of what I've got floating around back there, right? My old man memory yeah. uh, could be totally off. <laughs> now, so, Ricardo was asking about the muzzle flash. So, um, when it comes to muzzle brakes, it's really dependent to me on the, on the caliber that I'm shooting. So, like when we're talking about long range rifles, um, uh to talk about a future video here we're gonna take my 338 lapua um hunting rifle which currently has a terminator uh five break on it and we're going to you we're gonna get a um an ultradyne max or probably an ultradyne uh lr which is the long range muzzle break in 338 and we're gonna put that against the terminator and then um, I have a third company, which will leave us a surprise, who's going to supply us with their new muzzle brake. And we're going to test recoil reduction because, honestly, aside from putting it on like a 50 BMG, the 338 Lapua has some kick to it. So the recoil, we're going to check the recoil on all three of those muzzle brakes and kind of decide, you know, which's going to reduce the recoil the much, uh, you know, the most, but also. Um, how it handles barrel rise, uh, because especially if you're hunting, you know, you want to maintain your sight on and have as 
little as much as uh, barrel uh, barrel jump as possible. So if you have to do a follow up shot, you're still on target. So we're going to be doing that. Um, but um, for several of my rifles here, I'm a big fan of the Ultradyne uh, LR and their um, Ultradyne Max. Several other YouTubers have also put them against several other muzzle brakes, and they consistently come out on top. And the reason why we're doing this is I have a really dear friend of mine who's also been on this show who swears by the Terminator brakes, which I've never used. Um, and I swear by the Ultradyne. So we're going to, and I've never seen them compete. So we're going to do that and see how that works out. Yeah. So actually on my, on my little Ruger precision rifle, I've got a uh, two port Griffin armament uh, threaded um, brake. That I use, and the reason I use that actually, I've got a Form One uh, uh, suppressor that I built uh, that threads on for the Griffin Armament uh, break. That actually, it acts as a sacrificial baffle um, on yeah. on what I'll say the big boy. So my uh, my 6.5 millimeter uh, short action ultra magnum. Um, we got a little bit more of a break on him, uh, so that's actually running a um, Area 419 Hellfire match. Uh, from what I've seen now, actually in the Hellfire match is a great case, right? Talking about muzzle brakes um, and, you know, hey, what what sort of uh, torque should I look to apply? Because that one actually has a collar that you screw it all the way down until it bottoms out and then you back it up until it's nice and even. And then it's got a collar that you tighten, yep. right? But you never go more than hand tight. Um, and it's important to note that for muzzle brakes, getting them on is one thing, but you should always plan on being able to take them off as well because as you're shooting that muzzle brake is going to build up carbon right regardless it will always build up carbon and the more carbon you've got either on your muzzle or in your brake that can actually affect the way the gases are exiting and mm -hmm. so at some point i go longer than i probably ought to right but at some point you're going to want to pull that muzzle brake off soak it personally i like uh, clp right um, and my, my Griffin break in particular is parkerized, so it holds up to that pretty well. Um, but soak it in CLR to get all that carbon off, and then you're going to have to put it back on again, right? So, yeah. And for that one, truthfully, I just had a, uh, um, a crescent wrench, right? And I got it. I It, it had uh, spacer washings, get it where I wanted it, and just kind of give it a little twist, make sure it's on there like that guy. Where the barrel is you know we'll call it 60 to 80 foot pounds your muzzle brake is more like what 10 maybe 20 again stuff online they'll tell you more of the exact measurements there um, but it's significantly less than what you're trying to do for your barrel oh yeah uh without question <laughs> um i i have muzzle brakes on almost everything i have here um, including my like 0.17 um, and my uh, uh, 22 longs and 22 magnums. And people are like, well, why do you have a muzzle brake? Well, uh, one, they, they look really freaking cool. <laughs> but also it, it does help uh, for uh, consistency. Um, it, we talked about this in the past when you talk about flyers, when you're shooting and, and you get a flyer, 90... I would say 90% of the flyers are your mistake, not the rifles or the ammos. Um, it, it's consistency, right? So, you know, um, I have a, like my suppressor that I got, uh, which is a, a 30 cal and below a suppressor. I can put it on everything. Um, it screws on once again, like you said, with a muzzle brake, right? Uh, just a quick note, when we were talking about the ultra, uh, ultra dying, uh, muzzle brakes, they also have that, uh, that nut where you, you go all the way tight, screw on your, and then you torque that thing back. It makes it a lot easier, but, um, yeah, so everybody like just buys muzzle brakes. Um, there's some really good videos out there on muzzle brakes where they do a comparison um, uh, Gavin, the ultimate reloader, uh, they have invented a pressure mechanism to actually record the re you know, the recoil pressure 
for all the muzzle brakes, which is why I ended up buying the Ultra Dime because he had a whole group of them. And the, the top two was the Ultra Dime Max, followed by barely less the Ultra Dime Long Range. And I was like, yeah, we're doing that. So I often joke, like people give me a hard time and they're like, well, you know, why did you choose the, the 419 Hellfire match? And I was like, well, if you go look at all that's available online, it's easily the most obnoxious break for everybody else around you. And so, you know, I figured I'd be a jerk, but <laughs> you know, <laughs> it, it, it does a um, great job of taming down a, a, a Magnum cartridge. I was actually between that one and the Sidewinder, um, but I'm shooting the short action ultra magnum it's only i'll probably only be shooting about grains of powder which if you go to 65 you probably want the, the magnum size the sidewinder anyway it's a whole thing and probably oh, it makes, it makes perfect sense um, all, right, so, it, all of my uh bench rest friends that are watching this they're probably like bench rest guns with with muzzle brakes no right um generally speaking most of the guns in bench rest uh, do not have muzzle brakes like I yep. said, I, I really was building mine as a, hey, you know, let's go do this fun, fun game, get better at my craft as in preparation for maybe other things I might go do. And I mean, truthfully, it's just been such a fun time and such a great community. I can't recommend it enough, even if it's, you know, maybe not what you think of as where you want to be, right? Hey, I want to go do precision uh, rifle shooting and, you know, jumping up and shooting off of barricades and out of holes and all these different things. The interest community as a whole and and like the lessons that you learn there from known distance and reading the wind right i don't care what you're shooting where you're shooting how you're shooting it there is something to be learned that can be applied across all of uh better um better accuracy right in our craft yeah, no, um, I couldn't agree with you. But one of the, just a quick note here, one of the reasons why a lot of the bench rush shooters don't have muscle breaks is because the barrels are about this freaking thick and they're heavily weighted. So they don't freaking move. The only way they move is forward, back. You know, you move it forward, you take your shot, and the recoil brings it back. And it's just a very lateral movement. And that's all there is to it. I've never seen a bench rush jump at all because they're, I mean, they're heavily weighted they weigh a freaking ton uh well, and that's how it goes um that's actually probably Chris, a good spot to, i go was ahead. gonna say that might be actually a good spot to talk about uh the giving up your first born version of the pinterest gun right because as we get into that what are you looking at you're looking at specialty actions like custom actions as you mentioned often ones that are you know, right load left eject so that as I open that action, um, I'm disturbing the gun as absolutely little as possible in its in its resting position, right? I'm feeding in, I'm closing, and in many cases the the will close with I mean ounces of force to close. Again, every little bit of movement that that gun experiences is potentially taking it off of target. Um, usually, you'll see mechanical front rest. So, what do I mean by mechanical front rest? steel based um u-shaped right so they'll they'll look like this on the front end with leather bags right padding three inch wide four ends so to give them a good um lap movement surface the rear of the stock will usually be kind of uh, wider at the top more narrow at the bottom um with a flat yeah you know, usually inch inch and a half wide bottom um the bags you're using there protector are usually built by like a protector um company called protector and they'll be specialty cut for these types of stocks um often there'll be some sort of like a like a slick tape right that facilitates better sliding and even at that uh these guns are still moving well, two inches or less and it's literally a all right let's push it back up in the bags get it back on target um and the, the the cartridges that you're using are usually uh, six millimeter bench rest, right? Small cartridges. We're pushing six millimeter bullets fairly fast, right? But it's all in balancing the explosion, right? The, the muzzle velocity of the bullet, the weight of that bullet, right? And how much force it's creating against a 
often 20 plus pound gun, right? And in many cases, the gun may be built to shoot at a specific distance, right? A load may actually be tuned. And again, this gets into kind of the freaking magic, right? Uh, kind of thing for, for load tuning. But sometimes people will say, hey, I can shoot a half inch group at 100 yards. And then this same load will still shoot a half inch group at 200 yards. And then a three quarter inch group at 300 yards, right? And it's, it's a question of the dispersion of how, right, the oscillations are throwing that bullet around as it exits the barrel. And they may actually tune a load or a, an entire gun for shooting, hey, this is my 300-yard gun. Hey, this is my 700-yard gun. Hey, this is my 1,200-yard gun, uh, just for how those things are built, right? Um, barrels are generally custom cut by some of the top bench rests. There are specific bench rest um, gunsmiths that are well known for mating a particular barrel right facing the threads so that the threads are perfectly concentric to the bore to the ten thousandths of an inch inspecting the bore for absolute concentricity from uh, muzzle to to action uh, actions that are you know generally uh, like a panda or you know some of those sort of things um, defiance has a couple those are more field i guess um, Anyway, but particular actions tend to be preferred for rest shooting because of that absolute attention to detail, right? Now, um, but all of this coming together with tiny little tolerance differences to try and make this firearm that puts every bullet in exactly the same hole. And, you know, in a lot of cases, I'd say run of the mill, you're probably looking somewhere four thousand dollars for the gun before you even start talking about the optic right and that can pretty easily go seven thousand ten thousand dollars depending on in, in a lot of cases who built the gun right uh, and then optics depending on you know uh, my my vortex golden eagle is kind of on the lower end of that um another kind of big one that folks look for the uh, night force has a bench rest model um, that i think is also a 15 to 60 if i remember correctly but almost always there'll be eighth minute of angle adjustments to get just such fine differences to take into account, you know, one, maybe even half mile per hour differences in the wind as, as these guys are attempting to read those small differences in the wind and, and get every bullet laying just in on top of each other. Let me ask you a question here. Um, doing bench rest, do you prefer first focal plane or second focal plane and why? So in bench rest, it's not nearly as much of a decider for scopes, uh, interestingly. Um, for instance, the Vortex Gold Needle Eagle is a second focal plane scope. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the, why I the asked. rationale for that <laughs> is that it's yeah. a little bit easier to kind of create those second focal plane scopes, right? You can put maybe some more money into the optics without having to worry so much about other parts of the scope. Um, whereas in precision rifle series, you know, you're looking at, hey, I'm picking up, I'm running, I'm probably holding my windage or my elevation, right? And in a second focal plane scope, um, your holds for windage and elevation are going to change depending on magnification, right, et cetera. And so that first focal plane uh, question is, is much, much more relevant on like a precision rifle series type match where in some cases, certain stages, you may not even be allowed to change your um, your elevation or windage, right? You may be shooting 400 yards on this target, 600 yards on that target, 1,200 yards on this target over here. And, uh, you know, maybe I decided to set my elevation to the 800-yard target while I'm holding for everything else, right? Yeah. In addition to the windage. Um, and whether I'm at, you know, 10x or 20x, I need those measurements to always be absolutely relative to the target I'm shooting. Um, so let's let's go. Where do you think you can get into bench rest shooting at the bare minimum cost, and what would you use? Hmm. And then after that, we'll talk about the buy once, cry once sure. here. Yeah, I'd say cost wise, 
I think taking the Ruger Precision Rifle is a good um, kind of baseline, right? And you yeah. can find a, a reasonable, well cared for, potentially used um, uh, Ruger Precision Rifle for probably somewhere between eight hundred and a thousand dollars, if I had to guess, right? Yep. Personally, I like six Creedmoors. Six five Creedmoors, a great round. Um, you know, is that is that a bench rest round? No, not really. Those guys are all going to be shooting probably six PPC, uh, six millimeter uh, bench rest, right? A lot of those sort of rounds. But that's okay, right? You can get that on your next barrel. So when you shoot this barrel out, you can order in a mail-in barrel, get whatever you want next. It'll still shoot it just fine, right? The same bolt face. Um, the bolt face is the thing I'd probably pay the most attention to. So figure, call it a thousand dollars on the rifle. Call it a thousand. All right. I don't think you could probably go somewhere to a thousand dollars on the scope, right? I think um, you're, you're breaking up a little bit. I can't hear oh, you. Oh, can you hear me now? Is it is a little yeah. bit better? Okay. Yeah, I'd say uh, on the scope, realistically, with today's market, there are actually some really, really great scopes out there in the $500 range, right? In some cases, even less. Um, I'm kind of on fan, right? I feel like they do a really good job of paying for the buck. I promise I'm not getting paid, but they were sponsored by any of those guys at all. Uh, I don't know if they're listening to me. Uh, but no, uh, the Athlon side, uh, I think you can easily find a really good quality scope to really get you into the game at, at $500 if you want to splurge. You know, a thousand bucks really uh, could be easily done. Um, I'd always recommend uh, maybe a, either a bipod or a good front bag. Even some of the bigger Caldwell bags can be really good. Um, you're going to want a rear bag um, that you kind of like a squeeze bag, right, to take your heartbeat from your hand out of the equation. And so, you know, if we go front bag, that's probably your cheaper route. Call it 30 bucks. Rear bag. Truthfully, you can make your own really, really easily. I'm probably fair to say you could make your front bag, right? Um, out of you know uh, parts of a pillowcase and some rice or sand. Absolutely, rear bag the same way, right? A rear squeeze bag. There's a lot of good plans out there. Save some money there as well. But let's say you didn't. Um, I think you could probably find both of those in together under a hundred bucks total. So what are we at? Thousand. Another 500 on a scope, 1500 bucks. You know, um, personally, I would highly recommend a reloading setup um, just for kind of tailoring the loads to the gun. But at the same time, let's say you found a Ruger Precision Rifle in six Creedmoor, the Hornady ammo, the match ammo that's out there, absolutely legitimate. Now, is it going to win a Ventress match? No, it's not. But getting out there to compete against yourself, the ammo will probably not be the limiting factor, right? And I think that's kind of the biggest yep. thing out of the gate. You hit a key point there. Uh, the problem that I saw when I was doing competition shotgun shooting more than anything else was the fact that people weren't competing against themselves. They're trying to compete against everybody else. Yep. And that's when frustration kicks in. <laughs> and that's when you start making big mistakes. So. To me, every time I compete, I don't care what anyone else is doing. What I'm trying to do is better than I did last week. And if you compete against yourself and you focus on just improving, um, I've won matches that way where people are like, oh, dude, you won? And I'm like, wait, I did? And they're like, yeah, weren't you paying attention? I'm like, no, I, I never pay attention <laughs> to anyone's score but myself. And if I win, awesome. If I don't win, did I have a good time? Yeah, awesome. And that's that's how you should compete because psychologically, if if you're so worried about everybody else, you're not going to do well. Right. Well, it's I find that it makes it a whole lot harder to let the bad shots go, right? And there will always be a shot that doesn't go exactly where you want it to land. It happens, yep. right? <laughs> so if uh, if you had the budget <laughs> and you wanted to do the buy once, cry once, what would you get? 
Tell me and well, and name the brands. Tell me, like if well, I could just have anything, this is exactly what, what I want. Tell me the rifle, the scope, um, the bipods, or you know, the bags or the rest. You know, what gear what would you have? Like, for instance, yep. um, I just got a Kestrel uh 5700X uh that they sent me for my uh my upcoming video for Quest to a, a Mile. So they sent me that to not only review it, but I'm also going to be doing several uh, videos on how to use a Kestrel because it's not intuitive. <laughs> <laughs> but if if you could have anything, tell me what would you get? Yeah, no, I think, and actually your mention of the Kestrel is a great place to start, right? Where as you start looking at money is no object, um, so many of the uh, competitors in a bench rest match, you know, they're coming out there worried about, density altitude right parametric pressure uh the temperature of the day is the sun like how high is the sun coming off of the target because the light coming off of the target as the sun moves will the apparent placement of the target will actually shift in relation to how you're seeing it through the scope the mirage I'm not that good right yeah. <laughs> like these these are guys that are worried about an inch at 800 yards right um but you know, to your point of the Kestrel, right? A Kestrel is a phenomenal bit of kit. Um, I am a huge proponent of the applied ballistics uh, engine, right? And, you know, Kestrel has some versions that have the applied ballistics calculators built in. Um, with Pinterest, it's always known distance shooting, right? And so now our laser rangefinder becomes not such a big deal. Um, but Knowing your dope, right? Your elevation and windage is absolutely vital. Um, so if you know the distance, but you don't know the wind, you're going to be all over, right? Um, often what you'll see is people with uh, wind flags that they'll put out at intervals between themselves and the target. And you can actually stage those sort of helpers in some uh, um bench rest matches you can stage that kind of gear ahead of the match starting right um but kestrel absolutely invaluable now for the rest of it mechanical front rest i mean that is probably one of the, the most significant helps right um something that will help you adjust elevation of the front of your rifle in you know tenths or less of an inch right with a yeah, a large wheel you can turn, it's going to adjust the elevation, get you exactly where you want to be. Um, the rear bag protector is sort of the name to know there. And truthfully, I couldn't even tell you uh, how these start looking price wise. I know that some of the protector bags used will pretty easily go a couple hundred dollars, right? Yeah. Uh, front mechanical rests, you're probably talking, I'm going to guess a thousand dollars being one of the poorest price them out right um on the rifle itself uh custom designed weighted uh stocks generally will run somewhere in the 800 to a thousand dollar range it's been a while since i looked at them right um but there you go the the custom actions usually go between a thousand to fourteen hundred dollars uh, like a panda and such like those and you're probably looking at another eight hundred dollars just for the barrel blank plus gunsmithing time generally runs about as much as the barrel so you're another you know sixteen hundred dollars in the barrel and fitting it to the action um scope well full soft reaction right i mentioned panda but again lots of things out there um, uh, i don't see too many of the impact actions on the interest line um, oh, I'm just going to drive me crazy now. All the like, reaction name is just going right out of my head, so I apologize. But <clears throat> lots of really great um, suggestions. Key forum to kind of go looking at here, benchrestcentral.com, um, has phenomenal articles on all of this, right? Um, your standard uh, rifle barreling, you're going to be looking at uh, single point cut rifle barrels, um, and most of your, your top end guns are going to swear by that single rifling um, as opposed to the button rifle barrels are usually cheaper and a little bit easier to make there's a lot of 
conversation around can anybody actually shoot the difference between an equal quality of one versus the other? I know I couldn't, <laughs> right? But when the top gunsmiths say, hey, this is the thing I'm using, can we use this? I'll trust their decision. Uh, you know, that's the Krieger, Bartline um, are generally some of the, the top names there. Um, Rock Hill. Um, anyway. <laughs> And that's, I don't mean to leave out some of the long term names there, like Lilja, right? Lilja has some, a long list of records to its name. And I guarantee that there are, you know, at least three or four more that could easily be this that I have to mention. Right. That's awesome. It, uh, this is not a cheap sport. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, it's, it's funny because, uh, I mean, you talked about reloading and, and, and doing all this. Uh, this is, far more complicated than it is for shotgun but shotguns also considerably harder because you're shooting at fast moving targets and if you talk to things like sporting clays those targets add on multitude of different ranges uh it's not like skeet skeet the ranges are pretty consistent every time you play um but when you start doing things like sporting clays with shotguns Oh my God. It, it's like, well, should I do a modified choke or should I do a full <laughs> choke? And, you know, I was like, if I play skeet, it's skeet chokes and um, the same uh, uh, speed uh, uh, number nine uh, rounds. And it's great. Uh, well, we and, are and let's, actually let's kid ourselves, at, right? everything that we do. And when you go to shotgun games, right, everything is a game of percentages because that is not a solid bullet you're shooting. Right, it's a cloud yep. of shot, and does the cloud of shot wind up? Even if you shoot where you were planning on shooting, could that pigeon somehow find its way through that cloud of shot? Not very likely, but possible, right? <laughs> <laughs> hey, long range reaper just joined us. Um, uh, this is the 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 guy who <laughs> went took a, a shotgun guy like me and got me at 1219 yards in in less than two days um one of the greatest guys out there and he and he's spot on he he was basically saying he goes either you there shotgun guy he goes when you do with the fish tail went out to a mile it's a, a you know a, a a different animal absolutely um and i can only imagine um uh, Long Range Reaper is going to be working with me on my quest to a mile. Uh, he's one of, of the few people I trust more than anything in the world when it comes to, um, you know, firearms and long range shooting. He's 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 a very dear friend. Um, we are at the top of the hour now. Uh, Chad, thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate it. We're gonna have to get you back on, and and talk about you know uh, more details uh, when it comes to bench rest, and um, you can talk about some of the rules involved and all that. So we'll make that another episode in the near future. Uh, Chad and I actually met during work. <laughs> uh, his company has, uh, uh, is a vendor that we've been talking to at the company I work at. And uh, he was a, a demo and we were just chatting uh, beforehand and found out we're all, you know, into, you know, uh, long range uh, shooting and so forth. And uh, it was like instant friends just out of water. So um, we're, we're going to be talking a lot more in the near future. Chad, thank you so much. Um, I really, really appreciate it. And uh I'm Rob Lupo from Lupo Outdoors. Uh, please like and subscribe on our YouTube channel. We have so much coming up this year. Uh, I promise you, you don't want to miss it. Thanks, Thanks again, buddy. <laughs>